Hey kids, today I wanted to go into some technical details about the new Harbor Freight Predator 9500 generator. These are really great units that are extremely popular and tend to sell out quickly, often in less than a day or so when they come into stock. So if you see one of these and you want to get it, you better jump on it quick. So why are these so popular? Well, to start with, they're inverter generators, which means they're making their power electronically versus just directly tapping into the generator windings. This means the power is clean and it's totally safe for electronics. This also means that you can run two or more of these units in parallel to double your output because the same electronics that are making that clean power can also match the frequency of another connected machine. And even better, since unlike regular generators, the frequency of the power is not tied to engine speed. So this allows the generator to slow the engine down when the energy loads are lighter, resulting in significant fuel savings, much quieter operation, and longer run times. Now, inverter generators are fairly common, but what makes these more unique is that they can produce 240 volt power, allowing you to safely run your major appliances like stoves, dryers, or central air conditioners. And when those loads kick in and strain the generator, unlike conventional generators, the quality of the power is still extremely good. And these particular units make a lot of that good clean power at 30 amps or 7200 watts continuous load. And for those brief surges, up to almost 40 amps or 9500 watts of power can be made. Now run two of them together, and now you've got 60 amps of clean power at your disposal with surges up to around 79 or 80 amps. So for an investment of around $4,000, a soft start for your central AC unit, and building a parallel kit, you can have much cleaner power than you'd ever get from a home backup generator at less than half the cost. And that's what I needed for my all-electric home. Now there are a variety of videos out there that already cover unboxing it and showing it running different appliances, so I'm going to skip on most of that and get into some of the technical details and some key important considerations and a couple of aftermarket parts you might want to add to really get the most out of your unit. So let's start in order. When you get the unit, it's heavy, weighing in around 253 pounds and the box is huge. You're probably going to need a truck and expect at least two people to get the box out of it. The generator ships on a small wooden platform that keeps it off the wheels. And under that lifted generator, you'll find the accessory box. It has the oil fill funnel and a variety of plugs and instructions, that sort of thing. You'll also need to provide the quart of oil it takes to fill it before you can start it, in addition to another quart of oil that you'll need after the break-in period. And you'll also need to provide fuel stabilizer and, of course, the fuel as well. And keep in mind, once you've used that funnel, it's going to have oil residue on it, so expect to need to keep that bagged or, trust me, it's going to make a mess. And speaking of oil, this brings me to my first real warning with regard to these generators. Get a magnetic dipstick, or if you really don't want to spend the 30 or so dollars to protect your $2,000 generator, at a minimum, put a really strong magnet under the area where you fill the oil. And here's why. These units don't have oil filters, and when they're breaking in, they make metal shavings. Lots of metal shavings. Both of my 9500 units did this, as well as my much smaller portable inverter generator. In this picture, I used a strong magnet for the first hour or so of operation, and it looked like I was growing metal crystals inside the little fill tube thing here. And you can get a nice aluminum dipstick for these on Amazon that has a magnetic tip that'll do a pretty good job of collecting all that metallic junk out of the oil. The problem's far worse at the beginning, first few hours of operation, but even after 16 hours or so as seen here, there's still quite a bit being picked up out of the oil. Now, Harbor Freight tells you to change the oil at 30 hours after the break-in period, so that means for 30 hours of operation, you'd have all that metal circulating over and over, causing premature wear in the engine. No bueno. So please consider getting one of these nice dipsticks. I have no affiliation with them, I just found them on Amazon and find that they work really great for my units. And when working with the oil, be sure to move that wiring in the split loom tubing out of the way. Oil will happily drip straight into there and, and just sit on the insulated wiring making a mess. Ask me how I know. Now, moving on, when running, the insulated plastic housing keeps the unit remarkably quiet. And this was a short video that I shot kind of testing the audio levels. In eco mode, about 89 decibels. About eight feet away. Now we're about 84. So eight feet away, we're looking at almost. So we ended up finding that the Harbor Freight spec of 67 decibels was indeed accurate. 
if measured from around 25 feet away, and the unit was throttled down in eco mode. So these do have good mufflers and can be run in suburbia without making your neighbors absolutely hate you, apart from the fact that you'll have power and they don't, which does lead me to one of my next key complaints. The generator has an engine operated fan blowing heat out of the right side and drawing cool air in on the front and back panels. Nearby that vent, the engine also exhausts out the right side. So this makes running two side by side problematic because if they're facing the same direction, one is going to end up melting the plastic housing of the other one. So this means that unless you position them facing opposite directions and can handle the exhaust going in two different ways, your best bet is to put them end to end, making a nearly six foot choo-choo train of generators and designing a longer power cable for one of them if you want to make a parallel kit. If you do decide to extend the exhaust pipe out for an enclosure, I wouldn't suggest directly attaching a longer metal pipe to the 1.5 inch exhaust that's on the engine because it vibrates quite a bit and you'll likely end up breaking the weld on the muffler or on the exhaust. Instead, find some 1.5 inch silicone high temperature rated tubing as the junction, allowing that to deal with the vibrations on the engine. Now I have a whole nother video that covers the parallel kit that I made, but I did have a request for a wiring diagram, so I'll show that here. The parallel cables all just link together by color and then go into the 50 amp dryer plug. On mine, I also added some electronic amp meters that add in like this with the coils monitoring the output legs. You'll also need to power the amp meters, so each one goes onto either the X or the Y leg, so you, you can measure the voltage from one side or the other. If you're interested in that build, check out the video where I go into the more details about that. So next, while we're on the wiring and such, let's talk about how the front panel's wired. When in 240 volt mode, which you should just stay in, the wiring works out like this. On the generator, the parallel outputs are a direct feed from the inverter bypassing the breakers. The household outlets on the front are fed from the red Y leg, while the 30 amp 110 socket on the left is fed from the B leg. And the 240 volt socket on the right receives everything, both X, Y, neutral and ground, and is controlled by that 30 amp breaker above it. So this should be helpful to know if you need to run 110 volt appliances and to balance things out between both legs, giving you more capacity. The power itself, even with two units combined, is as clean or even better than that which I get from my power company. I have another video where I use an oscilloscope to compare the power of a traditional generator, main power, and an inverter generator. And to kind of see the difference is really night and day, but, but take this as a teaser. It's some really nice clean power and even with heavy loads hitting it like my stove here or even the central air conditioner seen here and should you overload the generator or if it accidentally shuts down while under load such as if you happen to run out of gas your power doesn't go crazy like it does with a normal generator it just cuts to zero at the end so you don't have to worry about your whole house getting surged or electronics getting fried so one of my other questions was does the built-in battery get charged while the generator was running? I assumed yes. I mean, the thing's making power. You'd think it would charge the battery, but I wanted to confirm that. So I did find that the battery would go up from 13.35 volts up well past 14 while it was operating. Additionally, my meter also indicated that when starting, it seems to draw about 0.9 amps. I guess my final tip would be to pick up a pack of these magnetic sockets for your drill or impact driver. Harbor Freight calls them nut setter bits, and for $1.99, the 8mm one in particular will make your life far easier, as it seems every single bolt on this thing matches that one for removing the covers and accessing panels. It's a perfect match for that size. So keep an eye out for the oscilloscope power quality comparison video, as well as one on my AC soft starter, and one on how I did my generator inlet hookup. So I hope that helps you guys out, and let me know if you have any questions in the comments.